Dear Lord, as we open up your word today, we ask that you would speak to us, that we would leave here with a better understanding of whose we are, the life you call us into, and a desire to be in a full relationship with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you've not been with us over the last couple of weeks, maybe you've been out of town, or you're a guest, we are in the midst of a 31-week series, really a journey through the Bible. And we're using a resource, this book called The Story, as a guide to help us understand how God has moved throughout the Bible, to really understand his story. Now, the book is not a replacement for the Bible, but a resource to really help us understand how we fit in to God's story. Just a few weeks back, we read that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then we turn to the end of the Bible and we see that there's a need for a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth. And part of the journey that we're on is finding out what happened between the first creation and the new creation and why there had to be a new creation. And there are two aspects of God's story that we're focusing on. The first is the upper story and that's where we see that God has a plan to bring everything back to himself, to redeem and restore, to set things right. And then there's the, the lower story, where we see how God's story is lived out in the ordinary details of folks just like us. And like people in the Bible, we have dreams, we have plans for the future that sometimes don't pan out in the way that we expect. Well, over five years ago, my wife and I were living in Southern California, and, and things were great. My wife and I both loved our jobs. We had great community, and we were in, preparing to really put down roots and to buy our dream home. And through a random, uh, some random connections with some friends, we had the opportunity to be a part of a TV show called House Hunters Renovation. And I want to show the first bar, part of that show to you right here. That is really cool. Although it's not really the craftsman style I'm looking for. Newlyweds Andrew and Caitlin are looking to buy their first home together. I'm all for a fixer. I can do a lot of the work myself. I want it done right. Not saying that you can't. Okay, I'm sorry. But finding even a fixer in their price range in Burbank, California is going to be a challenge. This is literally oh, missing a, the wall. Yeah, that one's a big one. We need to replace all of the appliances, and it has carpeting in the kitchen, which is disgusting. And once they decide on a house, the real work begins. Oh. <laughs> okay. Sweetie, sweetie, it's not like a drill. It's a saw. <laughs> well, there's really no turning back at this point. It's happening. And a long renovation starts to wear on Caitlin. This is all very overwhelming, and I just want to move in. Despite a few setbacks, Andrew and Caitlin managed to create their dream home. We loved this kitchen. I never in a million years believed that we would ever have a house this size. Ever. So, we will not see the rest next week. <laughs> but here's the deal. Here's what they didn't tell you. One week after filming wrapped up, Caitlin and I, it literally nearly the exact moment, heard clearly from God that it was time for us to go. Now, what I will tell you is that um, later that week, we were sitting, it was a February day, we were sitting outside in shorts and a t-shirt out on our front porch, and we were looking at all the different open positions in, in our denomination. And I came across this one church that I thought seemed to be promising. It was Dardeen Prairie at the time. That's what I thought. Missouri. And Caitlin said, where is Missouri? <laughs> now, you know, the question is, how many of us have started out a season of our lives with optimism, all the doors seem wide open, but things did not turn out the way that we planned? Now, and sometimes, like us moving to Missouri, finding a new church home, it really is even better than our wildest dreams. Better than we could ever have hoped for. But other times, it's not so much. And maybe like us, 
we have a similar story. We got married, we moved here to Missouri, and we thought kids, kids were going to come easily. But over the last couple of years, we struggled with infertility and had to go through the IVF treatments and all the mess and expense and, and really heartache that that can be. And maybe for others of you, you know, you found this perfect guy or perfect girl. And you think back to dating and your, and your, your wedding day, and it's just the most beautiful day you could have imagined. Everything was, seemed um, hopeful. The future seemed bright. But just a few years down the road or even a few decades, you look back and your relationships are a mess. And that person that was in your life that you were committed to is no longer with you. Or maybe you went through school and you're in a job now that you hate or you feel stuck and you don't really feel like you're living your dream. And I, I can't tell you how many families that I've stood with at gravesides right here in this, others right here in this very room. And we have just said goodbye to a loved one. And their words to me were, it was not supposed to be like this. We had big plans. We had dreams. Have you ever experienced this? Where you have these dreams, you have these plans, and they don't end up or turn out like you expect them? Well, today we're going to meet a guy named Joseph right at the end of the book of Genesis. And his life begins with great dreams, but takes a huge turn, and those dreams become nightmares. As we open up the Bible, we meet what has to be one of the most dysfunctional families in all of history. Genesis 37 tells us that Joseph, who's Abraham, who we looked at last week, it's his great-grandson, was born into a large family, Jacob, uh, Joseph's dad, had two wives and two concubines. Now, the norm of that day was that the more children a wife gave their husband, the more the husband valued their wife. Now, talk about a reality show. I mean, that is a mess. But for Jacob, who was Joseph's father, we all, who, who becomes known as Israel, there was one wife that he adored, and her name was Rachel, and Rachel was Joseph's mom. Do you guys follow along? Joseph's mom's Rachel. Rachel was Jacob's favorite wife, and this made Joseph the favorite of all the children. Now, this wasn't a secret, as we read. So now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons, because he had been born to him in his old age. This is in Genesis 37, and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. And as the, as the favorite, Joseph got away with everything. Now, when it came time to get new clothes, Joseph got the best, he got the newest. His brothers went to Goodwill. When Joseph got a gift, his brothers got an Etch-A-Sketch, Joseph got an iPad. <laughs> and all this did was feed the anger of his brothers towards him. And not only was he the favorite, but we read that he was a dreamer. In one particular dream, it says that we were binding sheaves. He shared this dream with his brother. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheep rose and stood upright. Well, your sheaves gather around mine and bow down to it. And in another... This time the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. And in each of these dreams, what he's relating to his brothers is that I was lifted up, you and mom and dad were all bowing down to me. And in a culture where respect and honor are everything, this sent his brothers over the edge. And it says in verse 8, and they hated him all the more because of his dreams and of what he said. One day, Joseph is sent out to the field where his brothers are. The Bible says that his brothers saw him coming from a long way off. How do you think they recognized it was Joseph? Because he was wearing a fancy coat. In Genesis 37, it says, they, you know, this is crazy. They have so much contempt 
for their brother. They don't even use his name. He said, here comes that dreamer. Come, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. So the brothers get together and they begin planning. The first brother, Reuben, knows that if things go bad, that he will look bad. So he says, look, let's not kill him, let's throw him into this cistern. And then another brother, after Reuben leaves, says, I've got one better. Let's get rid of him. Let's sell him to one of these traveling groups, to the Ishmaelites. Now, if you remember, or if you're following along in the story, the Ishmaelites are descendants of Ishmael. And the Bible tells us that Ishmael and his brothers would all Ishmael and his brother would always be at odds with one another. And so Judah, Joseph's brother, sells his brother into slavery. For 20 pieces of silver, Joseph is sold, taken to Egypt. His robe is torn off, dipped in blood. And he's purchased by a man named Potiphar. And Potiphar is the the captain of the guard. And so what we have is Joseph goes from this place of blessing and place of of love and uh, like this pedestal, and he gets crushed. And now he's a nobody. He's a slave. Now despite the pain from his family and being in slavery, God, or Joseph recognizes that God is still with him. And Potiphar, his master, recognizes Joseph's character, his leadership, and and that there were blessings associated with Joseph. Even if it was not where Joseph planned to be, things are pretty good for him. That is, until he catches the eye of his master's wife, Mrs. Potiphar. So says, now Joseph was well-built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. Now, here's the deal. Joseph had every opportunity to give in. In fact, he could have made any number of excuses. It would have been so easy for him to justify. Look, I've had a raw deal. My family betrayed me. My life's been hard, so I'm going to do exactly what I want. But here's the surprise of the story. It says, no one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? You see, no matter what was happening in his world, Somehow, he connected with God in the midst of his disappointments. He lived his life in relationship not to his situation, but Joseph lived in relationship with God. Still, Potiphar's wife accuses him of rape, and to prove her point, takes his coat from him, and he is thrown into jail. And it's not even his fault. And maybe this is where you and I would get a little bitter. Maybe we get a little angry. See, God, I did everything right. I honored you. I sought the best, your best for me. Yet one more time, my world has fallen apart. And it's in those times that I hope that when I'm feeling that way, That when we're feeling that way, we speak into one another and we remind each other that God is still in charge. That God is still God and we may not fully understand what's going on in the moment. But God is writing our story and we know how it ends. I came across these I thought were just really helpful. It says, you know, God may not move you to a new place but may make a new place, excuse me, may make a new you in an old place. God may not take you out of the circumstance, but can make a new you in the midst of that circumstance. And then one more. The place of greatest pain may may be the place of God's greatest presence 
in your life. Now, I think this is one of the things that Joseph discovered. See, as the story continues, word got out that someone was trying to poison Pharaoh. So two members of Pharaoh's staff were also thrown into prison with Joseph. One is the baker, and one is a cupbearer. And they had dreams, and Joseph was there to interpret them. And to the cupbearer, he says, in two days, your dream is telling me that you will be home, you will be safe. And to the baker, the things will not be well for you. For your dream says that you will be put to death. And both of these interpretations came true. And the one thing that Joseph asked of the cupbearer was that when you get out, tell them about me. Get me out of this place. But those days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into months, and all the hope that Joseph has seems to be lost. Now, two years later, Pharaoh has a dream. Pharaoh is the most powerful person in this region of the world. And no one can interpret it. But the cupbearer remembers Joseph. And so Pharaoh summons Joseph to his palace. And Joseph says, I know what your dream says. There's going to be a famine in the land. But you have time to prepare for it. So Pharaoh says this, I hereby put you, Joseph, in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. Then don't miss this. It says, he dressed him in robes of fine linen. Now the first two robes, or the first two coats that Joseph has are ripped away in shame. One by his family and one by his false accuser. And both of them are used against him. And now Pharaoh gives him literally one of the finest robes that money can buy. And along with that, unimaginable power over what is probably the most powerful kingdom of, of his time. And the, account, and the account continues. So the world enters into a famine and people are starving all over the region. So Joseph's birth family comes down to Egypt to get grain. And when Joseph confronts his brothers, he does the unthinkable. He says that he forgives them. And, you know, and how do we know that he forgives them? We have two clues in the names that Joseph gives his children. See, when Joseph has his first child, it says that Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, it is because God has made me forget all of my troubles and all my father's household. You see, Manasseh comes with the understanding of forgiveness. So why did Joseph not arrest and put to death his brothers when he saw them? But instead, literally it says he wept and wanted to put his arms around them and hung them? It's because God took away Joseph's anger. God helped Joseph forget that he had been sold into slavery and had lived there for nearly 22 years. And then it says Joseph had a second son. And that son he named Ephraim and said, it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. You know what Ephraim means? God has blessed me. So with these two children, Every single day when he looks at him and calls their names, he is reminded that he can't remember all of the ways that he's been hurt. And he lives with the perspective that God has blessed him. Now, in the story, we read that Joseph's father died. And when this happens, the brothers are nervous. Is this the time that he's going to take his revenge on us? that he's going to let us have it. But Joseph says this to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You see, Joseph recognized 
recognizes that in the good and in the bad times, God was with him and blessing him. And this is exactly how Joseph lived his life. Wouldn't you love to have that perspective on the hurts that you've experienced, on the bitterness you carry, on the anger that tears you up? So how did Joseph endure all of this without losing faith in God? How did he keep from remaining bitter, vengeful, and angry? Well, Joseph lived with a conviction, with a faith, a faith just like his great-grandfather Abraham, that God was in charge and has the power over every detail of his life. See, Joseph realized that in every situation, God was at work, no matter how people intended their actions, good or bad. That God coordinates and organizes what seems like independent activities, thoughts and ideas, movements of people, pulls them all together to bring about his plan. The Bible goes on to tell us that the whole family is invited to Egypt. And in Genesis 50, it says that Joseph lived to see three more generations, to have many great years. But in a couple of years, there will be another Pharaoh, one who does not know Joseph, one that does not know his story. And in a sense, the coat of blessing will once again be ripped away from God's people. And for those Israelites who are brought into Egypt, they will be put into slavery for over 400 years. And after that time, God will raise up a new leader, a man named Moses, who God will use to free them from slavery. But I don't want you to leave without hearing this, without knowing this, that your disappointments, your dysfunction, your sin, your mistakes, those things that seem to rip away the code of blessing do not have the last word. But my hope is that like Joseph, you would remember to trust in God and his faithfulness. For throughout Joseph's life, he learned this truth. People will let you down. Our circumstances will disappoint us. Temptation will try to destroy us. Trouble will weigh us down. But God will never fail us. And one day, God would come, sending Jesus Christ, who would come with the attitude of a servant, who would be betrayed by his own people, and through his life and his death and the shedding of his blood, would offer us complete forgiveness and hope in every single circumstance. And it is by faith in his life and his death and his resurrection that we will be given a coat of incredible blessing, a coat of incredible colors that will never be ripped away. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, may we learn from the model of Joseph who trusted you in all situations, who turned to you knowing that whatever he faced, whatever is done to him, Lord, that you would work for good. May we live with that perspective. May you remind us in, in the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ that we are given unimaginable hope, unimaginable power, do that act, and by our faith, we are not only forgiven, but we are invited into a relationship with Lord Almighty. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.